I'm going to ask the congregation to stand. Everybody, please stand if you can. I want you to help me welcome our Father, Dr. Never Smumba. Let us pray. And now, eternal God, who in your infinite wisdom chose that we be born in this land of Zambia, and those born from other countries as well, it was so designed by yourself. Therefore, in your wisdom, you have set a movement in place for each one of our lives paths for each one of us to follow, roads for each one of us to walk. Therefore, anyone within the sound of my voice, may none of them, none, miss their path. I would ask that, Lord, may they continue to endure until they reach their destination. The efforts of the enemy to disrupt or to derail them I bring them under the subjection of the authority of the name of Jesus. I decree and declare that this day, the words that shall be spoken shall transcend the airwaves of media and everything available to us to touch a life and to touch a heart. Transform us, give us purpose for being alive today. Give us purpose for being here today. I pray for those that have joined us across the world. As I break the bread of life, I ask that, Lord, may you touch these lips of clay as I endeavor to break the bread of life. I give you praise and I ask it from the bottom of my heart with thanksgiving. We all say amen. We, also, we all say amen. amen. You may be seated in God's presence. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a morning. First of all, let me bring my special greetings and love from my wife, Florence, who is only going to be in Kitwe on Tuesday because of what we are doing in Lusaka. But I'm glad that I'm here today. Allow me to make a few comments before I offload that which the Lord has laid on my heart for this particular Sunday. First of all, I would like to thank Pastor Cyrus Pastor Gertrude, for this special Sunday that you've set aside to remember where we come from as a body, as a family. Um, I'm not used to this. I'm not used to people stopping and start to say, you've done this, thank you. I rarely get those thanks. So you can imagine it's, it's very touching for me. Um, and sometimes I'm lost at words because I, I am trained and used to criticism uh, and insults. That's, that's my world. So when people say what you're saying, it's like a shock that people can actually say good things about me because it's like, you know, the enemy has taken the airwaves and they are the ones who command um, what is said. So when you say those words to me, and just to remind us of the goodness of God, because sometimes we forget. Let me take this opportunity to thank you again for this Sunday and all the good wishes and prayers and the support that you've given to me. I'm going to share some things from my heart today, and I hope that it's going to be all right. For the past 79 days, I have not accepted to preach in any church. Those that have asked me to preach, I've told them, no, thank you. 79 days of spending time with God and talking with him. 79 days 
I've been asking God questions and having a conversation with him. And that's a good thing about God. You can actually have conversations with him. Sometimes they may even sound disrespectful when you're asking honest questions. But he's your God. Seven, nine days because I, I was wrestling with God about why should I? And this is the human side, but I'll come to what God said to me. I've been struggling with God and wrestling with him. I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach? Probably the church, and I know this is strange, but I'm sharing with you my inner moments with God, which are supposed to be just between me and God. But the Lord told me to be free so that you can also grow from it. I said, God, why should I stand to preach to a congregation? Knowing in my heart that although some of them came to know the Lord through me and got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I married them off, 95 or 97% of them did not even vote for me. So why should I? Why don't they find somebody they like to preach to them? You know, I'm, I'm human. Is that okay? And I know you, would, you wouldn't go through this, you know, but these are the mountains that you were talking about that we have to cross. I don't mind an unbeliever not doing it. And I don't even mind the fact that sometimes you know that you are disadvantaged in an election. Not that I, I thought I was gonna win the last election, I was the most disadvantaged. We had no cash because you didn't give. And we were under fights um, from the strongest party that was there at that time. So I knew we were not gonna do well, but I knew that I had more than at least 100,000 believers out there that even if I didn't step into their houses, they'll still do it. Now that's human, and I'll come to that. So I said, why should I? Why should I? And these are, so let them preach to themselves. <laughs> why should I shed a tear for one of them to get healed and delivered when they really don't care? All they care about is their healing and their prosperity. Then I remember a friend of mine called me from Canada, you know him, Pastor Kirby Lockhart, he's been here several times. He's my covenant brother for many, many years. He said, Nevis, I don't know, but I've been going through this. He didn't know I was praying and I was going through this process. He said, you know, the Lord wanted me to share the story about T.D. Jakes. He said, I've just been listening to his moving testimony, how, what happened when his mother died. T.D. Jakes was very close to his mother. Those of you that have listened to him preach, he hardly preaches without mentioning his mother. They're, they're probably very close. But when she died, it was a devastation in his life. He was totally devastated. So he announced the funeral and said, on such and such a day, we are going to have the funeral in the smaller church where they started from, not in the big mega church they have built. And as the day came and they went for the funeral, they discovered that he discovered that that small church was not even filled. And yet on Sundays, there's tens and tens of thousands in his church. But in the small church they went for the funeral of his own mother, something that was personal and painful, his members didn't come. Just half the church. Then he made a statement privately. He said, never again am I going to live for these people. Because they don't care. So let me look for those who care and invest in their lives. Maybe my family, maybe start a business or something. So every preacher goes through this. But you know the Lord turned me around because I started to see all these experiences in the Bible. Now I appreciate Jonah's story. Because I've always thought Jonah was crazy and he was not spiritual, but Jonah had, had an issue with the people of Nineveh. There was something there. That when he was sent there, he refused, I'm not going to go there. Because these people, I know them. That's what the Bible says. You remember that? I know these people, I'm not going there, God. Find somebody else. But uh, eventually he had an encounter with God. He was on his way to Tarshish. And finally he went to Nineveh and did what God wanted him to do. Jesus was the same. The people that he healed and ministered to are the same ones who said, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, the man of God. Barabbas was a murderer. 
And they said, give us Barabbas, he's, he's the right one. We don't care about this Jesus. Just crucify him. When that was communicated to me a few weeks ago as I was praying, and then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Nevis, when I died for you, you were not doing pretty good. You were not doing, doing really good. You were a mess. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he didn't die for us because we were worthy or we were clean or we were good. He, in fact, he died for us because we were terrible. We were bad and grateful and thankful and even cursing him as he went to the cross to die for us. When that revelation came, I realized that ministry is not about people giving back to you. It's about you giving to God, the author and the finisher of our faith. So I'm here to celebrate God with you. The choices are yours. But I'm here to celebrate God with you. We all owe it to him, only to him. So today I'm glad to be here. And what does this mean? That now after 79 days, I'm ready to preach. This is what I call fighting back. Because I could have gone on that slope and maybe you would never have heard of me because many have done that. They have gone on that slope and they've never come back. What I've just told you can destroy you, can finish every energy you have in you, can make you retire from ministry because the questions are too many. But the only time that you can see a change in your destiny is if you choose to fight back. And I'm here today to preach on a message entitled, Fight Back. Because the enemy is going to take you to such laws that you'll be justified not to continue. You'll be justified to let go of your ministry. You'll be justified to give up your business. You'll be justified to give up your marriage. You'll be justified to become crazy. You'll be justified to take off your clothes and walk on the streets with a begging boy. You'll be justified because it's a terrible slop. But I have a word from God for you today. The word is, when the world slaps you, fight back. Mm, I don't know what I'm preaching today, but this is something God said when I said, I don't even have a word for these people because I'm angry with them. What am I going to tell them? God said, just tell them what I've ministered to you over the last 79 days. Tell them about yourself and this confrontation you and I have had. Just talk to them about this disrespectful conversation you've been having with me. Tell them. Tell them. I said, are you sure? I said, he said, tell them. Because most of them are on that slope. They have lost everything. They have lost the fight. You never hear of them again. Because the sickness has suggested to them that it's over. But he said, go back there and tell them to fight back. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to, to appreciate the fact that if you don't fight back, you shall die. I need to correct the theology that I've been teaching you over the years that maybe you have only gotten one side of the record. The records we used to play when we were young had side one, side two. The LP, long play. Uh, you know, umbikle polumba number two on side two. It means that you have to turn the record. So I, I want you to understand that where we stand in terms of fighting back, if you don't fight back, the enemy will take you. And some of you are almost gone. I pray that this message is going to bring you back to a fight. You know, I have asked questions of what if Joseph did not fight back after Ziklag. 
You, I'm going to read that. That's my text for this morning. But what if he had not fought back after Ziklag? What would have happened to his two wives and to his children? That would have been the end of it. What if Joseph had not fought back in that jail by still believing in the gift that God has given to him? What would have happened to Joseph, but more to Egypt, or even more seriously to that generation that was saved by Joseph? What if, what if Ezekiel had said the bones are too dry? I, I, nothing can come out of it. I'm, don't play with me, God. This is, this is a finished affair. It will never. What if he had not obeyed the voice of God to say, now, thus saith the Lord, dry bones, live again. What if he had not said those words? What, what, what would have happened to that devastation? It still would be in the same valley. Bones will still be in the valley. What if? There is somebody here that I can say, what if? Because you are not dealing with your failures. I used to preach to you that when somebody slaps you on one cheek, give them the other cheek. I've come with a different message. Back. The way we have described Christianity in our nation and in the world has brought problems to and created wimps who call themselves holy Christians. Wimps who can stand up and say, I'm not going to lose my job on false accusations. I'm going to. Don't, don't, don't let anybody take what belongs to you. You believers, you've given up too much in the name of Christianity. Stand up and say, I'm not going to let go because I'm going. We have preached to you on how tender you should be as Christians. We have destroyed your destinies. We have created wimps and scared people hiding behind the Bible, being weak. They can't stand up for what is right. God said, if you don't fight back, you're gone. Jesus was not a wimp. Yes, he told them, give it to me on the other cheek. But when he went to that temple and found them selling stuff in that temple, he didn't say, me, I'm Jesus, the son of God. He looked for a whip. And whip them guys running in their long robes for their lives. Because he fought back. Fighting back is what's going to give you what belongs to you. The Bible calls it the fight of faith. And you have spiritualized that by meaning the fight of faith is in the spirit. No, it's not in the spirit. There's only one fight. The meaning of fight is fight. There's no spiritual fight and physical fight. They are just, it's just a fight. Whether you're fighting in the spirit or in the physical, it's still a fight. Fight back. What has left me where I am today is because God has taught me this lesson. Never, don't sit out there and feel sorry for yourself. And think somebody will come there and pat you on the back as all oh, poor nervous. I don't need no poor nervous. I, I, I'm looking for my opponent to, f to fight back. If I have survived, I've climbed many mountains. Climb them because I was fighting back. This ministry could have died a long time ago. They called me a failure of a little evangelist. They will not come to your crusade. From Chinsali, what good thing comes from there? But as they spoke, they put it on me and I fought back. When I went to Lusaka for the first conference, the bishops there announced in their churches, don't go there. There's a little proud boy who thinks we can shut down our churches to go and listen to him. But we, we fought back. 
until the conference became a national and international phenomenon. But it would not have happened if I had felt sorry for myself. Jesus said to the disciples, do not cry for me. Do not feel sorry for me. You go out there and do what you're supposed to do. I come to Kitwa to let you know victory. Stop crying for me. Mm, 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 mm. Don't, don't. I know you get embarrassed when I lose an election. When you look at the numbers, the only reason I got those few numbers is because you didn't vote. So you understand that if you had voted, I would. So don't worry about that. Don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves, Jesus said. I'm coming out. Jesus was indirectly saying as he was on the cross. He said, don't worry about me. I'm coming out of this one. Because I'm going to fight from the cross. If, if I won't fight from the cross, when they put me in the grave, I'll fight from the grave. Because I'm going to fight my way out of this. The demons were celebrating when Jesus was put in the tomb. But after three days, he fought his way back and rose from the dead. And I am saved because of that. Listen, the greatest thing is ahead of you. But it only comes after the fight. Let me talk about this death issue before I read the scripture. Because I think that I've gone ahead of myself and it doesn't matter. You, you know, you, you have to understand that life is never given on a silver platter. And the devil wants to destroy you. And he's going to use discouragement to do that. Where I stand now today, a lot of my friends have not come this far. If they went through what I've gone through, this is not the, I'm now scratching the mountain of political transformation of my country. But I'm going to fight back. Every fall, gets me another fight. This mountain shall come down just like the others came down. Because when we were fighting the other mountains, they told us we could not climb it. But because we kept scratching, somehow, somewhere, there'll be a little twig that will be able to hold on so that we can make the last step. Just keep, just keep fighting. Somebody say, fight back. I don't care whether it's a lady. Some of you, we have taught you stuff that has just made you poorer than you should have been. And you have accepted it. The poorest group of people in Zambia are Pentecostal believers. You have no money, most of you. And the few of you that have money, they are overburdened by the thousands who don't have money. Every day, brother, the Lord spoke to me, lying prophetically to the brothers who have got money, sisters who have got money. Young brothers in the Lord are marrying old women in order to have a life from a lady who has worked hard all her life because their theology is wrong. Poverty is not yours. And if you are poor, I want you today to get up and fight back. If what you're doing is making you the way you are, then you better change it. Yeah. Reinhard Bonke, my mentor, used to say, if your religion doesn't change you, then you better change your religion. I don't care whether religion is Pentecostalism or charismatic. If it doesn't give you wholeness, it's better change the way you, you do your business. Am I boring you this morning? Because I haven't started to preach. That was an introduction that has nothing to do with the message. But I want you to quickly turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to end quick because I've already made my point. The book of 1 Samuel. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me, please. Chapter number 30. If you find it, say amen. Amen. If you find it, say amen. amen. Is it there? No. Just let me read it. Listen to this story. Give me a moment. The Bible says, And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, 
that the Amalekites had made a raid upon the south and upon Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken captive the women and all that were therein, both small and great. They slew not any but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city of Ziklag, behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something for me just for the next 15 minutes. I want you to listen to me and to the reading of the word as a reality and see what's about to happen to you. Because usually when we read the Bible, it's a historical event to which we don't relate. I want to mention to you today that what I'm reading is a proven story that truly happened even in the history of Israel, not just through the Bible. In the reports of biblical history of Israel, this event actually took place. And because it took place, I want to walk with you in the emotions of David. If David was a human being like Nevis Mumba, and he goes through what I went through 79 days ago, I'm sure his emotions were ab about the same. Uh, do you hear what I'm saying? The difference between some of us and some of you is that we truly believe what the Bible says. We believe in the stories of the Bible. Some of you think it's just literature to pass an exam. I believe these are given to us to realize that other people have gone through it and come out of it. So David went through this experience. And I want you to listen to this because some of you are not even listening. I know that story. I read it many times to my children. No, this is not your children. This is to you. Forget the children. In fact, the children hear you more than you hear from other people. So for a moment, hear me. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Remember, these are men of war. These are not some wimps who play solo per market, people solo. No, these are not the ones. These are warriors who kill. They were trained for war. And the Bible says, when they recognized their situation, they wept until they had no more power to weep. Somebody say amen. And David's two wives were taken captive. Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. When that word is used, distressed, I have been distressed. I know what it feels. Nothing matters. I have no appetite. I really don't care what happens when I'm distressed. I don't care if God comes and cuts my head off or not because I've already blamed him for my difficulties. Do whatever you want to do. You call yourself God. Here you are, leaving me all lying there. People would never bow their knee to you. Look at them rejoicing. Come on, God. You play with them. Leave me alone. Don't, don't, don't touch me. Those of you who are married know about ladies. If you have offended her, you can bring a gift. You know what? Just leave me alone. Okay, just... Women are like they have got the same parents. They behave exactly. You, you kneel down and say, honey, listen. You know what? You know what? Just, 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 just give me space. Just, just. You know what? They're in a totally different space. Look, you've injured me. And, and I'm going to sit here trying to say, lovey, lovey. No, I'm angry. Keep your flowers. That's what I was like a few days ago. God giving me flowers. I said, I don't need no flowers. Give me comfort. I don't need no comfort. Just go and bless those people you want to bless. Those are the ones you've been wanting to bless anyway all this time. You, I just didn't know. You just go ahead, bless them. Just, just give me space. God, I want to think about it. And I know some of you are saying, to myself, yes, I did. <laughs> But you're a pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a pastor with emotions. And God himself put these emotions in me. I said, no. 
no, 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 let's talk about this. Let's just give me some space. Give me 79 days at least. Just 79 days to think about this. It's just... And when you see a woman behave like that, I've got a piece of advice. So just leave her alone. It will take twice as long to resolve it. Just take the flowers, put them somewhere else, and just, yeah. I don't know about the others, but I know that about my wife. I can see it in her eyes. Even the walk changes. Then I know this is not flower time. <laughs> but if you are an indisciplined or unlearned young husband, you are, hey, honey, honey. <laughs> and you are <laughs> so that was my experience with God. But David great, was greatly stressed. He, he was stressed. For the people spoke not only about going to recall those people, but they spoke of stoning David because the soul of all the people were grie was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughters. And you must understand when the Bible talks about this, it actually means that his sons, his daughters were gone, but David had to do something about what he was going through. And that was to strengthen himself in the Lord. Now, people of God, listen. Of all that I'm going to say today, especially men, I want you to listen to this line. David came to a conclusion that for me to get out of here, I can only strengthen myself in the Lord. And I want to teach you on how you can do that because that's not as easy as you think it is. And David said to Abiata the priest, the son of Ahimelech, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiata brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired of Jehovah, saying, If I pursue after this troop, shall I overtake them? Everybody look at brother, never stop looking anywhere else, because this is why I came. If I pursue these that have made me desolate, Am I going to overtake them? And listen to what the Bible says. And he answered him. God answered him with one word. Really, the rest of it is just to reemphasize it. Pursue. For thou shalt surely overtake them. And thou shalt recover all without fail. Fighting back is not abstract. You don't just stand there. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't like to fight because I didn't grow up with a lot of physical strength. I was a young, little, light-skinned boy, and if the wind was strong enough, I would stumble and fall. So in my fighting, I never used to fight other boys because without fail, they grounded me. Without fail, they grounded me. So I didn't like those physical fights. But there were fights I liked. I liked to fight with women. <laughs> because at least there I stood a chance that I'll go back home saying, in common, in Kalopola, but it's just a girl. But at least it gives you the self-confidence that, you understand? You can't be whipped every day by boys. You're going to lose what it means to be a man. You find some weaker opponent and so that you have a testimony. You know, you got to get some testimony. Uh, but before I lose my thoughts, I don't want to go ahead of myself. But I want you to understand about learning to fight back when you can until I found out that women were actually more dangerous than men. <laughs> Took me a long time because every time the fight, the fight was over, 
They stop at nothing, they touch everything. They touch everything. They, they, they just fight with anything available to them. It's got no rules when you're fighting with women. Because to them it's survival. It's, it's survival. So this is what I want to teach you today. Yes, some of the battles the women win in their desperation. But fighting back that I'm preaching about, you don't fight like that. You gotta know what you are doing. You can't just say, let alone fighting back. No, 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 you gotta anchor your fight on something. <sighs> David anchored it on the word of God. Pursue. He took that word and put his arms around it. If God has said it, I'm going to go and fight back. Yes, they'll beat me, but God said it. So I'm, if you anchor your fight on what God has spoken, you shall overcome. But if you anchor it on anger and desperation and let me show them that's really not the basis for your victory. The basis is has God said it and God said pursue it doesn't mean you will not face problems pursue you shall face problems but since I've spoken you shall come back with a spoil somebody shout amen, amen. now let me just tell this story and begin to close as I encourage somebody here today David was already in trouble David was a troubled gentleman. He was actually running away from Saul. Some of you do not know what it means to be pursued by a president. Wanting your life. I've been there not once, not twice, but many times. I've been there, Brother Ben, when you guys had to put me in the boot of the car to drive from Kapiri to Lusaka to hide me from the special branch. Those who were pursuing us. We had to change cars along the way. Now I can reveal this as a time I was taken into Malawi in the boot of my car without anybody knowing because I was fleeing from the wrath of a king. I was fleeing. I can give you story after story. When in Malawi, I had no money on me. My team just dumped me there and I said, get away from here. How do you go where you're going? It was a Saturday. I said, I need to look for some place to preach on Sunday. You got to find out when you are in trouble, what is your gift? Yes. Oh. What is your gift? What is your gift? It's your gift that will get you out. Oh, it's the interpretation of dreams by Joseph that got him out of jail. You, you got to find the gift when you are all stuck and out. Was in Malawi with nothing. I started to go around and found an old preacher friend. Told him I was in town and I was available to bless his people. According to him, he was so blessed, he thought I was joking. He said, Brother Nevis, you want to preach for me? I said, yes. He didn't know what I was going through. <laughs> and he didn't even need to give me any money. Because I didn't talk about it. But in my heart, I was hoping, I said, this is Africa. These guys may not give me anything, but Lord, speak to him in the night. <laughs> At least let there be an offering tomorrow or something. So I preached with tears in my eyes. They thought I was weeping over their plight. I was crying for myself. Being pursued by a king. Being pursued by a president. I preached with tears in my eyes. I think they saw the passion and they raised an offering. It was just enough to buy me an air ticket to South Africa. My whole family that time was in Dallas, Texas. And I had to run to go to America. But the ticket only got me to South Africa. I got there and I said, okay, to buy a ticket to America, I may need more than one Sunday. So I called my friends and organized three Sundays of preaching. 
I'll preach here the next Sunday. And when I put the money together, I bought a ticket, one-way ticket to Dallas. My family was waiting for me. I had fled from the enemy, but nothing moved me from here to America except my gifts. You got to know what God has placed in your life and use it. That's why you got it. So you must understand that to fight back does not mean you start to look for what you don't have. Fighting back, God said to Moses, what is it that you have in your hands? What is it that you have in your hands? That's how you fight back. The Egyptians are coming in their chariots. And Moses is terrified. He knows that's the end of his life. And he didn't know where to go. Just like most of you today, you really don't know where to go. Financially, you have no ideas. Business-wise, you have no ideas. The debt is rising up. People want their money back. You have not paid your rent yet. Electricity is dwindling. The units are finished. The water now is being turned down. Everything seems to be shutting down. What then? What do I do now? Don't, don't you start to complain and cry because that's not going to give you your money for rentals. Look around yourself. Fight back. Don't let the devil tell you, you know, you are justified to be like this. No, I'm not justified. I'm going to fight back. I'm going to bite you and, until you let go of what belongs to me. Church, stop this wimpy behavior. I taught you that before, but I've come to correct it. Right. Because if I taught you anything else, I'll be lying. My life has not been easy. Each step has been a fight. All you can do is... Don't worry. But for now, for now... You are not in my shoes. You don't know what I'm fighting because I don't tell you everything. All you see is never Swumba on television. You don't know what is going on in the background. You don't know why I'm taking that decision because it's not you. You can say what you want to say, but fight your own fight of faith. Some of you, oh God, tell me what you're saying. Some of you are here today. It's almost finished. You have no more strength to weep. You have no more strength. You have called everybody you know negative. You have texted everybody on your list in your phone negative. You have tried everything and it's not working. I have come in my apostolic role today. In the name of Jesus. You are not going to give up. That is not your end. That is not your destination. That is not your plight forever. I stand here as a servant of God. I decree and I declare. Look to your right. You see a little window there. Begin to climb out of your mess. Fight back. Don't let somebody come in the morning. He was drinking all night. He is your boss at work. And he decides to fire you for something you never did. Then we begin to say, well, I'm a child of God. God will provide another job for me. No. Fight back. Find out what the rules of your company say. Don't you give up just because you're a child of God. Fight back. Anybody that has made up in this world, they have learned how to fight back. I don't care whether you're a woman or a man, just fight. How many of you are going to fight because the Bible says the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Wala for. Fight back. You are dying in your hands. 
And the devil tells you, you know what? This condition will remain this way until the child dies. You've got to find a way to fight it back. I have come this far victory because I've learned what I'm teaching you. I have no real reason to be here still preaching to you after what I've gone through. Some of you don't know even a third of what I've gone through because I don't tell you. But I'm still here. This is 44 years later. I'm still here because I've taken every fight by myself. And I've told God I fell yesterday, but I'm not going to fail tomorrow. Muhammad Ali, he knew that he was the champion. But when they stripped him out of his championship, when he was beaten, he could not sleep because he was thinking of the fight back. Whenever you're downed, look for a way to fight back. There is always a way. Sit down, let me say something to you. And I'm going to close. Do you really know why I came here to talk to you apostolically now? Do you really know why we fight back? Church, hear me please from your spirit. I thought my biblical studies, my Bible studies were in vain. I told you in this church that since 1984, until today, until last night, I carry a biblical diary which gives me three scriptures to read every day. Two from the Old Testament, one from the book of Psalms, and one from the New Testament. I've done that since 1984, every day. I don't know how many years that is from 84 to today. Today is 2021, 38 years. Every morning, whether I'm in a campaign, whether I'm somewhere, my little few minutes in the morning, I treasure them to read the scriptures. Not because I'm going to preach tomorrow, but because I want to invest in this bank so that it's there to be withdrawn at an appropriate time. I thought it was a waste of time until I got into politics. Politics is vicious. And I realize if you don't have anything to hold on there, you cannot survive, you give up. But the moment you want to give up, then that scripture comes booming out. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them. You look around, where did I hear that? It's coming from the inside of you. You have deposited it. And, and when you're about to give up, you hear another voice saying, fight the good fight of faith. The moment you want to give up, says you are the head and not the tail. Many are the afflictions. How, where does that come from? Because you have deposited in your spirit. So I want to tell you today that what I thought was a waste of time that I read the Bible the way I read it. Now I know why. Because if I didn't have the word, I would not be standing in front of you. I've got many reasons to give up. Many, many. But within me comes courage. And I want to advise, recommend to you that this word looks natural. Get to give me your Bible. Just this one. This word looks natural when you are reading it. But it's like a training ground for the military. When you are training and touching the gun and the rifle, cocking it and, 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 and stripping it and all that. The day will come when you need that rifle. Just know how to use it. Know how to invest this word in your spirit. And nobody should be watching you. Do you know what I'm saying? That's not what I'm talking about. That, that's not investing in your spirit. I'm talking about you by yourself in the private corner of your chamber and say, dear God, what does the Bible say about this situation? And when you are in trouble, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Why? Because it's already there. In the moon, I call you, I have problems. I have problems. 
In fact, it's Pingo Charlie Lando. The piece of Paria. The piece of Paria. Charlie Lando, it's Pingo. Somewhere. Charlie Lando, Kutila. You want to own Chimfi. Ulele, Pastor. Ulele, Lando. I'm a saying, Ziam tribe, Moe, thinking that it's Bible. Bali Lando, it's Pingo Charlie Lando. Kalati, Murira, Uchingira, Wakalamba, Taocha. Pisa. Where, where, where? You are in trouble. You are trying to court from anywhere. Whatever you have is what you court. You, you, you think it's from the word of God. It's from Pansaka. <laughs> and I want to tell you today, if you want to anchor your fight back, anchor it on the word of God. God said to Joseph, I mean to David, go and pursue. That's what he held on. If God spoke it, it shall come to pass. Amen. It may take long, but it shall come to pass. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me now conclude here by saying the reason why I have endured is because I know who I am. Daniel 11.32 I believe. They that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I've asked myself how come I'm still here? It's because you know, the way I feel about myself, just give me a moment, son. Give me a moment, son. Wait, 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 wait. You know, the, the reason I am saying this is this. When I am going through problems and the strength I experience, there's one day I was in um, Mwembeshi Maximum Prison. I had been convicted for going to Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation. They convicted me and said I was a criminal and must be arrested and thrown in jail. And I was there, I think it was my second day or third day. Then a little, because there's a lot of intelligence information in, the, in jail. Those of you that have been to jail, if you want to know the latest happening in the country, go to jail. I don't know where they get the information from. They, they, they know everything because they have nothing else to, to do except to listen to, hey, hey. Whatever intelligence they give you in jail is almost true all the time. So one of the intelligence criminals comes to me, reforming criminal. He said, "Bam dala, my lord, refor kumufisa. Natu kumufisa nishi. Yeah, kuriyashi. Muriamu pension chanuri. At night, some dala nervous." I don't know, but so what, what's, that, what's that got to do with them? I said, you know when you were vice president, sir, you moved a bill, or rather you, you, you did a cab memo which you took to cabinet that gender violence, gender-based violence, those who mess around with children sexually, sexual abusers of children, I propose that instead of Okulabakaka three years, to live a kaka 25 years. And President Wanawasa agreed with me. And the whole cabinet agreed with me. And we changed the law to 20, from 20 to something years. The first place it arrives is the prisons. But by they are already judged, so no big deal. But around that time, anyone beyond that was arrested was given 20 years, 25 years. And they moved almost all of those criminals in that state to Mwembesh prison, because it was a new prison. So they said, these are serious offenders. Let's move them to Mwembesh. Eko Bantuala. Yeah, so we are under Bamdala, my Lord, we need a plan. But if Okumuchita can't, because some of these people have been here for 15 years because of you. You know, I'm here for 17 years. Then I say abuser, come watch. But me, I accept that I did the wrong thing. I can even stay for 50 years. But the others here that have planned to deal with you. I said, okay, that's fine. So I knelt down and I said, Lesser, I have no power to fight them back. I I I can't. These guys, some of them have killed people, you know, it's just a pastime thing and 
to kill me would not be a big problem. So then I prayed. Then the Lord in the night spoke to me. I said, you're in, he said that you're in good hands. Oh. The word came in. For the work, your works have gone ahead of you. So I said, which works? Then the Lord reminded me. He said they would differ amongst themselves. And by the following day, they differed. You know which group they differed with? In my office as vice president, we have the prerogative of mercy, and I chaired it as vice president. In that prerogative of mercy, we decided to pass a law that there will be no long, not really a law, a policy position that there will be no death penalty, will not be killing anyone under the Mwanawasa administration. So those who were on death penalty, we brought it to life. Those who were at life, we brought it to term. And those who were at a term, we reduced their term sentence. They were more that were about to leave prison who should have been hanged that were leaving prison the next week because of the law that we put in place. So they began to say, Without him, I would not be going home. I would have been hung. Somebody says, I was in the gallows hearing my friends being prayed for for the last time by the priest. We were the next. And then we received that news from Lusaka. And here I am. I'm going home next week. So I want you to understand that there comes a time when your own gift shall fight for you. There are many things you have done that you don't know that God is going to leverage in your future. And people may have forgotten about it, but God will save you. Joseph, in the prison, he was about to die in that prison. The two from the palace had dreams. And his gift was dream interpretation. And he interpreted the dream. And he ended up coming out of prison because of his gift, the dream. He fought back. He fought back by using his gift. Let me say this to you. Why have I taken this time this morning? I'm standing here because I fight back. Hello, you know, fight back. I'm 61 years old. I don't have time. Whether kumu suma and demu suma. Whether kumocha and democha. Because I don't have any more time. I, I, this time, when I'm attacking, this time I'm. This time, I'm going to tell you, Pastor Because I'm coming from the floor. One time I saw, um, what's his name? Muhammad Ali, floored by Holyfield, I think. He was on the floor or something. When he came up, he could not be stopped. And the game was over. I want to say this to you today. Fight until you come out of your situation. Fight until you come out of your situation. Get your fight back. In conclusion, two things happen when you go through a problem. When life slaps you. When life, like the Americans would say, when life does you in. Two things happen. The first thing that happens to you is to become hardened. Like a thief who has been beaten in prison so many times. He's so hardened that he's not afraid of anything. So the experiences of life harden you. But there's another group that I came for this morning. When you are hit, it disempowers you. You lose your fight. A lot of you have lost your fight. That is why you have now turned to just, if you find food, you just eat. You were thin, but now you're fat. Because you have given up. You have lost your fight. You've stopped combing your hair. You have stopped ironing your dress or your shirt. You know why you're doing all that? You have lost your fight. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, listen to me. Don't behave like you don't know what I'm talking about. There are people here, you have lost your fight, and I'm giving you examples of what happens when you lose your fight. Even your voice changes. Ah, mkwa yumu nilesa ngalefaya. Nilesa. 
He has lost his fight. He used to be smart. But now when you see him, it's, it's the problem of losing your fight. For the ladies, I'm a wig, you know, I'm like a quadrilla, Yavalandati, Nanuria, Comedia, Numa, Moriani, Bob Mukosha. Yara Moleka, the Quatua Tola, Fia Pachala, Bafuala, Uluchelo, Navawala, Posa Pachala, Bawig, because they have lost their fight. Tapali, Tapali, Nawava Monat, Sitava Leve Kava. What does that You lost your fight. You have gone through too much. You have cried too long. You are tired now. So cool, if you are so over so, because you you are now thinking food might solve your problems. So I can tell people that I have lost their fight. Even the walk changes. And I've come here to straighten that by God's word. Which means you are not chipua. You have lost your fight. I've come to town to let you know. Don't you lose your fight. Straighten your jacket and, and go borrow. Here is my advice to you. I know you are broke because of the problems. If you're going to borrow any money, I authorized you in God. I authorize you in God's name. Go and borrow some money. Buy you two suits. Buy you three ties. Buy you one pair of shoes. Let it shine like never sees shoe. And then come over there. You may not even have food at home. But you are making yourself feel good that I am not losing. I am winning. Do not die before you die. Ladies, change your wig. Ah, change it. Go over there and spend your last to shake yourself out of that situation so that you did you hear a fight? I think that I'm speaking by the spirit. When you look in the mirror today, it's not you anymore. Because you don't care, you have got more problems than Ifimina. So, why should you spend time when you have got issues? You have lost your fight. Someone in this place has lost his or her fight. I've come to let you know you need to get your fight back. And you start with small things. Polish your shoes this week. They'll start to notice. You've got a mask, you're wearing a blue dress, and your mask is another color. Go and buy a mask that matches your dress. And paint your nails according to your dress and your mask. Just do something different. Just, just start to come out of this thing. Just start to come out of this thing. Just start to come out of this thing. You can't be exactly where you are and think you're fighting back. Change your diet. Change your diet. One day just treat yourself. No girlfriend, no husband, just alone. Can I have a, order a French cuisine and just put it in Congola and put it there? It's not about. It's not about debt. Please understand. It's not about debt. It's about fighting back. It's debt, Mukalipila. You can sell a, a suit and pay for that meal, but you are on your way up. Your lady are not follow, which you have not used in 10 years. Look around and greet even those who don't know you. <laughs> Just you, 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 you are getting your fight back. Devil, you can't get me all my. I'm gonna get my fight back. Get your fight back. The Bible says seven times you shall fall, but seven times you shall rise again. Fight. Fight back. 
Everybody say fight back. Fight back. Say fight back. fight back. If you don't fight back, the enemy will destroy you. So how do you fight back? Shake your shoulders. Pilabale kubona tefio. Shitisha kamoto kwa 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 mfili okutalia ngole fikati hale uyale isa. Change it, sell it. Those of you that are working, get some money put on top of that and buy a respectable car. And I'm not saying everybody can do this. I'm just trying to tell you ways of fighting back. So that the only in Shamotoka, that feeling gives you a fight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for the spirit to fight back. Joseph fought back using his gift. He dreamt a dream and he was made prime minister. David fought back depending on the word spoken to him by God. Pursue and you shall recover all. He pursued and he recovered all. I now speak life over this congregation. I pray that starting today, may the spirit of fighting back come back. In the name of Jesus, you shall live and not die. In Jesus' name, amen. Every hand raised toward heaven. Everyone stand to your feet. Lift your hands toward heaven. Sometimes it's the theology that we have taught you that has made you a wimp. Nothing will be given to you because you're handsome or you're pretty. You're going to get it because you fight for it. There is an adrenaline of faith rising up in someone's life. And using my apostolic gift, Lord, I now speak life over this congregation. Those watching us by television or media of any type, I pray that may there be an unction of God's spirit that lifts them up from a place of defeat to a place of victory. In the name of Jesus, may today be the day that the testimony shall be made that I was on my way out, but I heard Neva Swumba tell me, fight back. I've been fighting back ever since. No wonder Muhammad Ali is called champion to his death. When you are defeated, it's the best time to plan a fight back. I give you all the praise and I give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 